Hi, my name is Sabrina Fernandez and usually when I show up here speaking English I should tell you how bad things are in Brazil. But not today. Today is about how bad things are in the entire planet. So yeah, let's talk a little bit about climate change, the new IPCC report and what scientists in general have to say about avoiding impending doom. So, the IPCC was founded in 1988 and it's now released the first part of its sixth assessment report on climate change. So, the point of the panel of scientists is to update us since the last major update in 2013. And this update, yes, it's full of bad news. Even though these reports are usually more conservative, it also means that conservative today means really bad things. I want to mention some of what's happening here in case you haven't read it on the news or other comments yet. One thing is clear, the IPCC has really declared that humanity is at fault for climate change and it's responsible in the sense that this is human-made, not some occasional natural phenomenon. I'll talk in a bit about this humanity is responsible and what this means, but for now what we have here is a huge body of scientists from 195 countries standing up once more to climate deniers and making sure that we understand, making sure that we understand that the situation is serious and it has to be dealt with. Some of the changes in climate today, they haven't been seen in thousands or hundreds of thousands of years. And this means very strong consequences. And this is also where we get the headlines. A lot of the news comments on this stress the changes that are now seen as irreversible. And this, of course, ended up leading to some fatalist thinking that yes, we're already falling over the abyss, we're already falling over the precipice, and there's nothing else to be done. So, too late. Well, that's a really bad interpretation of the message. Of course, yes, it's too late for a lot of things, but it's not too late for everything. We are still here. So there's still a lot to be salvaged. What it means is that things are a lot more severe than expected and that some processes that were set in motion will continue even if we stopped greenhouse gases emissions today. So in the report, they explained that a very strong reduction in emissions today will lead to some rapid positive changes in some things, for example, air quality. But when it comes to global temperatures, they will still take decades to stabilize. So sea level rise, for example, is something that will be part of life. It's not like you can just change seawater back into permafrost. It's not that simple. The report also emphasizes a few things that we've been saying for a while. This decade, this decade that we're in, it's crucial. We are already at 1.1 degrees Celsius in terms of warming since the 19th century and will be at 1.5 degrees Celsius within a few decades. So if we want to make sure we stop there at this threshold that we don't get to 2 degrees Celsius or even worse, action needs to be taken now and it needs to be massive action. So something else that is important from the report is that yes, climate change is already here. We are already living under it. It's not something that might happen in the future. There are already effects on the patterns of rainfall. For example, uh, the sea is already rising and the permafrost is already thawing. Heat waves and flooding connected to climate change are already part of our current reality. And these cannot be explained simply due to cyclical climate patterns. Based on this, there's hope that this first part of the report because there's more coming. This first part of the report will serve to urge the discussions and negotiations at the COP26 this year in a radical direction that will lead to really cutting emissions. So we're talking here about the climate conference, the climate negotiations coming up in Glasgow. And yes, there's hope that global delegations will finally understand how severe things are today and how severe things can be in the future and how we've wasted so much time. So yeah, there's hope, but I don't particularly share this hope. Yeah, and I'm gonna tell you why. As some of you may know, I come from the social sciences. I have a PhD in sociology, specialized in political economy, and I've been researching in the field of political ecology for over a decade now. And unfortunately, one thing I've come to understand whenever we're fighting climate denialism, uh, whether this is 
people who say there is no climate change at all, or people who dismiss the data and they just want to keep business as usual or they want to delay things. I've come to understand that in this struggle, that our request for them to, well, look, you should believe the science, you need to believe the science, you need to hear the scientists what they have to say on this. Usually, these requests are limited. Do you know why? So this is actually controversial to some people in the field of you know, scientific discussions, but climate science should it be considered to be just climatology or other earth sciences such as geology or geochemistry. It might be strange to some people, but social scientists also produce scientific knowledge that is incredibly relevant to the climate change debate. Uh, they also research climate change, they also evaluate sources of emissions, and they also issue reports, they also talk about adaptation and mitigation, and of course, they talk about a plan of action, they talk about policy suggestions and things like that. But most of the time, when someone is talking about believing the science, they just rule out the social scientists out of the category because, you know, politics, these people talk too much about politics. Social scientists, they tend to get politics involved and that gets things more complicated. If you get politics involved and you take one side and then people from the other side, they're not gonna listen to you. So guess what? We're in this rut because politics is indeed complicated and unless the entire scientific community around climate change gets involved into politics as well, our calls to believe the science, they will continue to, yeah, some people believing and some people actually paying attention to it, but we're still going to hit a wall called business as usual. I'm not saying that people in the atmospheric physics should start writing political reports on climate change. That's not it at all. The IPCC even says that its reports, they are neutral with respect to policy choices. And I respect this. I think this is important so people can actually focus on what they do best. Amazing. What I'm saying is something else. I'm saying that social scientists, they also have a lot to offer to the scientific discussion here. And they're also part of this community of scientists talking about climate change. But social scientists tend to be excluded or treated as second class because social scientists will end up bringing politics into the conversation. And usually this political part, it's seen as the job of non-scientists who need to read the scientific reports, the summary for the policymakers and believe those reports and then come up with their own policy choices as if that was separate. And this is why we need to ask ourselves, like what policy choices, how, what does it take actually to curb climate change? This brings us to the fact that political neutrality is not a real thing. You can actually write a neutral report in the sense that it's a technical report and this is excellent, very important. But to take this report seriously is a political choice. Even to be part of drafting a report like this, that's also political. Yeah, and how you interpret elements of it, that's definitely a political choice as well. And this means basically that our appeals to believe the science, they should also include social science that helps to explain why we're so behind the needed action and as well, what the direction should be. And this leads me to the point of how things complement each other here. When scientists affirm that climate change is human-made climate change, that's a very important statement. And other scientists are important to give the social explanations for human-made. These other scientists will help to explain that it's a phenomenon from human society, in particular, human society under capitalism. And this involves problems in general in terms of productivism and consumerism and these are problems that frame why fossil fuels are used at this level. It's not just because humans want to do it and this will allow us to understand the root cause and not simply human action in general but specific human action by specific humans. And by understanding this, we can come up with policy directions that actually deal with the problem rather than, you know, waste our time with the creation of these really false solutions around new markets and new ways to profit while pretending that these initiatives will actually do anything about stopping climate change. When we take the other side of climate science seriously, climate social science, we understand this statement of being a human made way better. If it's made by human society, 
why do some people think scientists focused on understanding human society should not be part of the scientific conversation? In fact, we know that building consensus the way the IPCC does also involves different scenarios and some flexibility in the interpretation of data. So there's room there for discussion. And on the political side, what evidence do we have to lead us to believe that it's a good idea to simply deliver hard numbers to a bunch of policy makers that represent competing interests and then complain that they didn't really hear the science? Well, there's a high level of confidence that this doesn't work anymore. Doesn't it make more sense to bring in the social scientists who have affirmed that for such a long time that band-aid policy solutions won't work? This is so frustrating because I've read the work of incredible climate scientists who are really on point with the data and with the projections, but when it comes to policy suggestions, policy directions, they tend to ignore what social scientists have been saying about capitalism and these market solutions that end up in the conversation all the time. They actually end up arguing for simply deploying all policies available because things are very urgent. But if they hear our side, they know that all policies available that's not an actual course of action. A lot of these proposals for fighting and mitigating climate change, they're actually going in completely opposite directions. They contradict each other. The reality is that climate change is a result of human politics, so it's impossible to treat the political part as simply an afterthought. It needs to be part how we explain the root cause as well. It's time that we understand that all scientists need to be valued in this conversation. And if there's any chance of actually changing things, we need to stop promoting this false separation between, you know, the technical side of things and the political side of things. We know that the responsibility for climate change is unequal. It's a minority creating this problem. But the impacts will be shared unequally too, and the majority, the poor actually, will have the bad, bad effects. So we can't leave the political prescription simply in the hands of a few negotiators and we need to promote and strengthen social movements demanding climate justice today, especially regarding the inequality of responsibility between rich and poor countries and how the poor everywhere stand to lose a lot, stand to lose the most. So saying human made needs to be qualified socially. Climate change is serious. There's a lot of damage already on the way, but we can stop it from getting worse. So I guess my message today is scientists, activists, and workers of the world unite.